Amen. Would you open your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 9? We're going to look at this passage for the third out of four times. I've been encouraged by a few of you who have mentioned to me that you took the challenge and have shared the gospel this week. The challenge is still before you, and I would love to hear about it if you do. I'd like to read the first seven verses of Isaiah chapter 9. Please listen and give due hearing to the word of God. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun in the land of Nephtali, with contempt. But later on he shall make it glorious. By the way of the sea, on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation, you shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil, for you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders. The rod of the oppressor as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you today that we know what child this was lying in the manger. We thank you that you have opened our eyes to see, our minds and hearts to understand and believe and love your Son. We thank you that this child who was born did also die, that we might be forgiven, and that he rose that we might have life. Father, thank you for this. Thank you for this Christmas season. Thank you for the beautiful songs and all of the celebratory uh, festivities, decorations, and all the things that go with it. Father, I pray that as we who are Christians celebrate Christmas, we will not do it in a superficial way, in a shallow way, in a commercial, consumeristic way, but with true profound joy, knowing who Christ is and what he has done. So, Father, be with us. Fill fill this place with your spirit. Teach us afresh who this child is. We ask it in his name. Amen. So, we've been looking at this famous prophecy in Isaiah 8 and 9, where Israel was given a promise, a promise of great hope. At the time of the prophecy, they lived in darkness, despair, decadence. We we saw this a few weeks ago, where the people of Israel had corrupt leaders, and they were following those corrupt leaders into all kinds of sin, selfishness, sensuality, idolatry, greed. Uh, It was a a dark time, a, a, a troubling time. But a time would come, Isaiah said, a time when they would walk in light, when their gloom would turn to gladness, when their anguish would become celebration, their mourning turned to dancing. Why? Because a child would be born, 
a son would be given, not just a son, but God's son would be king. And his kingdom of righteousness, of peace, would last forever and ever and ever. But if we fast forward 600 years from the time of this prophecy to when its fulfillment came, there was a sad turn in the story. The child came, he arrived, the king was born, the son was born, the kingdom was upon them, and the vast majority of the Jews rejected him. They didn't want him. They preferred the darkness they lived in to the kind of light which he brought. They wanted him to eradicate their physical and political trouble. It was great when Jesus was going around taking a couple of loaves and fishes and turning them into a feast for everyone. That's good. We, we like that kind of Messiah. When he was casting out demons and showing his power over the, the wind and the sea when he's out on the, on the boat and the storm blows up and he just says, stop, peace, be still, and the wind obeys. Hey, we like this guy. Think of the opportunities. Think of the potential here. But when he called them to self-sacrifice, to live for the benefit of someone else, to, to sacrifice their own personal well-being for the good of someone else, they hated him. They didn't want that kind of Messiah. They didn't want that kind of leader. They wanted a, an economic leader, a, a military Messiah, not a humble, forgiving one. They wanted freedom from Caesar not so much freedom from sin. And eventually they killed him because he wasn't the one they wanted him to be. Well, the same is true for many today in our nation. Although somewhat invertedly, people are not so much looking for Jesus who will be a political leader, but if his death and resurrection means everybody goes to heaven, great, we'll, we'll take that. And if his, his denial, his self-denial and, and generosity is motivation for people to be uh, giving to charity and to help the poor, that's great. People will accept that as well. Even Mahatma Gandhi said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. Remember when he said that? Or he's believed to have said that. Think about what he meant by that. First of all, he meant Christians don't act very Christ-like, but he said, I like your Christ. What would it take for a Hindu, a leading Hindu, to say, I like Jesus? What would it take for people today to say, I like Jesus? That sentiment only persists for people who pick and choose what part of Christ's story they want to accept cute little baby in the manger who needs mommy to tuck him in, oh, that's just precious. I'm not going to embarrass you, Steve Allen. Nobody knows that was you. <laughs> oh, I just did? Oh. It wasn't really you, it was Siri, right? The cute little baby, that's precious. And the, the selfless humanitarian who gives his life to show us how to be kind to one another. That's inspiring. But the sovereign Lord and judge who claims exclusive right to be our pathway to God and who exercises the authority to determine whether or not someone goes to heaven or hell, well, that's repulsive to many. But we have to take the story as it's presented in the Bible. We can't, in good faith, take the parts that we like and say, I want to believe that, but I don't like that part, so I'm going to cut that part out. I'm not going to believe that truth of Jesus because I don't like it. It's intellectually dishonest to do that. And so, in this Christmas season, and really in every season, we must make sure that we are not holding to a false or prejudiced opinion 
of who Jesus is. We must believe the truth. We must hold fast to the true hope and the real joy that Jesus brings. The Bible is not ours to pick through and decide what we'll accept and what we won't. We don't get to decide what is true about God's word. God's word gets to decide what is true about us. Besides, believing lies doesn't help anybody. It doesn't free anybody. It doesn't bring us out of darkness and ignorance and sin. But believing the truth of Jesus Christ does. So today, we're going to consider the the Bible's prophecy about two of the names by which Jesus would be called. They are Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God there in verse 6. We want to see what is true, what is really hopeful about this son given to us. So we begin with the label, the, the name Wonderful Counselor. What do you think of today when you think of counselors and counseling? Many of you have probably been to some form of of counseling. We usually think of an office where you lie down on a couch, right? There's somebody in a nice suit sitting a little bit behind you with a pencil and a pad of paper, and he's taking notes, and he says, tell me how you feel about this, or what comes to your mind when I say this, or tell me your problem. Or maybe we think about a, a circle, a group of people in a circle where there's a modi- moderator and, and you're sharing your struggles, your failures, your successes, and, and how you feel about those failures or those successes. We think about sharing our feelings with professionally trained psychologists or psychiatrists who can help us cope with stresses and uh, insecurities and those kinds of things. The objective of the counselor is usually to get what's inside out, to help the counselee reveal and release the turmoil that's churning inside. Sometimes there's a pursuit of change, of of relief, of overcoming things, but often the goal is, is to manage symptoms in a less destructive way. If you can keep from hurting yourself or hurting others, let's, let's try to cope with those things and manage those things better. And, and usually we seek counseling because we want to feel better. That's not the kind of counselor that Jesus is. People didn't leave counseling sessions with Christ necessarily feeling better. Later on, they would probably feel better, but their first instinct was not, Wow, I'm so happy I could sing! They would walk away reflecting and sober and pondering, challenged and confronted with major issues that needed to be transformed in their life. Well, this Hebrew word counselor here is not the the make you feel better counselor. It, It was an advisor. When you trace this word through the Old Testament, this was an advisor, almost always a military advisor. This was the guy who was the main consultant for the king. When the king was going to make any significant decision, but especially a military uh, strategic decision, he wanted his counselors around him. He wanted these advisors to give input to the situation. Before he did anything, he wanted recommendation from this guy. We think of cabinet members today and that kind of thing. He's the guy that whatever you were setting out to do, you wanted his thoughts on the matter. There are a couple of Proverbs that speak about these kinds of counselors and how we need them. You're probably familiar with these. Proverbs 11, 14 says this, Where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. And again, this is the counselor, the the military strategist. Uh, The people are not going to have success if we don't have good input from people that can help. Uh, The next one is Proverbs 15, 22. It says, Without counsel, plans fail. But with many advisors, they succeed. Now, of course, the point is not just to get a bunch of people with opinions to tell you stuff. Everybody's got opinions. We can gather a bunch of counselors and advisors who want to share their opinions, and that's not going to help you. You need, you need people that actually can give good advice to this decision that you're making. Someone who's been down this path before, who has some experience, some expertise in this area. Uh, so don't just pull together friends and say, what do you think, and then make a decision based on their counsel. That's not ultimately going to help you. In fact, what we tend to do in those situations is pull people together that we think will tell us what we want to hear, right? I, I want to spend the money on this, so I'm going to ask some people that I think will say, yeah, you should spend money on that. That's a great idea. You need people that can give good, 
discerning, objective counsel. That's what this word counselor is speaking of. People who are capable of speaking prudently about a situation. That's what Isaiah said Jesus would be. He would be a a strategist, an advisor, a counselor in the most profoundly and extraordinary ways. He would come and teach his people how to please God, how to glorify God, how to live life the way God wants you to, how to walk in the light, how to overcome our real enemies, sin, death, the enemy of our souls. He, he wasn't going to come and make you feel good, but on the things that should matter to you, the kinds of decisions that have eternal consequences, this child would come and he would be the one you would want to receive advice and instruction from. And his counsel would be wonderful, amazing, extraordinary, this word means. Beyond man's capability, he wouldn't tell you stuff that just any ordinary guy would say. But it would be marvelous. It would be atypical. He wouldn't suggest things that are merely common sense. He wouldn't simply explore people's emotional sensitivities. His counsel contained the very words of eternal life. Remember that one encounter when everybody's leaving because Jesus said some very hard things? He had fed them, he had provided food for them, and they said, this is great, and they said, give us more, and he said, I'm the bread of life, you need to consume me, and they started leaving. They didn't want to hear that. They wanted real food, not you food. And finally, he's left just with his 12 disciples, and he turned to them and said, are you going to leave too? It was not a feel-good session. Are you guys going to jump ship here too? And I wish somehow the, the Greek language could communicate tone because what they said next, everything hinges on their tone. You probably know the words, right? They said, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. But I want to know how they said it. Was it a moment of great inspiration and loyalty and devotion? Where would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. Or did they say, where would we go? You're the only one that has the words of eternal life. We're kind of stuck here. We don't want to be here. But you do have those words of eternal life. We've got to stay with you. What, what, how do they say it? That's the kind of counsel he gave. Consume me. Eat and drink me. If you drink the water that I give, you'll never thirst again. Jesus' instructions were extraordinary, even as a young boy. Do you remember when he's 12 years old and he's uh, found missing and his parents go finally discover him in the temple? And of course, they do what any parents would do. What are you doing, son? Why would you leave us? Don't you ever leave us again? You know, can you imagine lecturing God? Don't you ever leave us again, son? <laughs> but what's fascinating is in uh, chapter 2, verses 40 through 47, we're told that th he was filled with wisdom, even at 12 years old. Now, now parents of 12-year-olds, 12-year-old boys, how many of you would want to claim that your 12-year-old boy is filled with wisdom. I'm not there yet. i got time, but some days I think we're not on a very fast track to that. But other days I think, wow, you might surprise me. But Jesus at 12, I'm just playing with you, son. <laughs> Jesus at 12 years old says he was filled with wisdom, and he's teaching the rabbis and the scribes and the scholars, men who had spent their whole lives studying the scripture and studying theology. You know, they had PhDs in God's word, and Jesus, as a 12-year-old, is teaching them, and the scripture says they were astonished and amazed at what he said. His counsel was extraordinary. It was thought-provoking. It was challenging. It was amazing.
But of course, it was his teaching as an adult that truly confounded the Jewish leaders. People marveled at his words. He seemed to either win their lifelong allegiance or provoke their disdain. He divided people everywhere he went with what he said. And we don't see a lot of disinterest. We don't see a lot of indifference. We don't have people going, meh, whatever, that guy is uh, fine. One way or the other, they were impressed by his instruction, either for him or against him, but that's the kind of impact he had. Well, there's so much to choose from. We could read through the Gospels and just time and time again see this extraordinary counsel that he gave, but we're going limit, to limit ourselves to three from the Sermon on the Mount. The first one I want to just consider briefly is Matthew 5, 5 from the Beatitudes, where, where Jesus said this, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. Now, I know some of you just went through the Beatitudes with Dwight, and I wasn't in there. I'm, I'm sure we agree on, on everything. But I'm not going to get into it as much as, as he probably did, but just kind of taking a 30,000-foot view of this statement. It's contrary to the way we typically think or the way the world would advise. They tell you advancement requires you to assert yourself. You have to go for the gold. You have to fight your way to the top. Run over people if you have to. It's a dog-eat-dog world, right? We get books like uh, How to Swim with the Sharks Without Getting Eaten Alive and, and Make Your Own Career. You be a self-made man or woman. You go and give it all that you've got to get to where you're trying to get to. Go, fight, win. Jesus said things like, the last will be first. The last will be first. The first will be last. He said things like, the greatest among you will be servant of all. It's not something we hear a lot, read about a lot in uh, management books and executive, chief executive books and that kind of thing. You remember the story? Jesus has been teaching about his kingdom, been telling his disciples it's time, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, a couple of the boys get together and they talk amongst one another and they start comparing notes. This is going to be great. His kingdom is almost here. Which one of us is going to be the greatest? I mean, well, it's going to be one of us, surely. You know, we're brothers. It's got to be you or me. It's probably me, me, but maybe it's going to be you, but it's going to be one of us. And, and let's just let's, let's go ask him, shall we? I mean, can you imagine? Let's go ask Jesus. Hey, Jesus, uh, mom asked us to ask you. When this kingdom thing happens, which one of us is going to be the greatest? Am I going to sit on your right hand? You know, that's the place of power and authority. Or is, is he going to sit on your right hand? But it's got to be one of us, right? I mean, look at us. Who, who, who wouldn't pick us? Just, again, to, to get a glimpse of the look on Jesus' face when they said that. I'm sure it told the story. Jesus said, you want to be great? This is how you be great. Serve everybody. Serve everybody else. That's kingdom greatness. That's not the worldly wisdom of today. That's not what people are saying. You want to be great, serve everybody. Oh, there's, there's this sort of superficial mantra among leadership, uh, in leadership books, that you need to, you know, the, you've, you've heard, the, it's a great illustration that a rising tide raises all ships. That's good, and that's true, and it's useful, but in, in most of these, there's still an underlying self-interest. You make everybody else prosper so you can achieve your goals and get what you want. At the end of the day, this is the most effective way to, to be on top, is you help everybody else succeed. That's what Jesus meant. He said, it doesn't matter, you don't matter, what, your success is not the issue. Just love people and serve them. You see that they prosper because you want to bless them. That's how you're great in my kingdom. It's extraordinary, unusual. And here he says, those who are gentle, those who are meek, those who are humble, those are the people who will inherit the world. Do you see how wonderful this is? You don't have to spend your life pursuing success to be successful. 
Your destiny is not contingent upon becoming smarter, faster, more talented, better looking. It's not contingent on those kind of things. You don't have to hit it big and get a string of good luck. You don't have to exhaust yourself putting in 100 hours a week or matching the work ethic of some super producer or super executive or super mom, super wife. You don't have to do those things to get to the top. What you have to do is wait on the Lord. We just sang about it. The everlasting God, he will strengthen us. He will bear us up on the eagle's wings. We just wait on him. We just rest in him. We just trust him. We are meek and gentle and humble, and we inherit the world. Takes the pressure off. How many Americans do you suppose are worn out or burned out or strung out because of a relentless pursuit of something more. You realize this comes from an atheistic evolutionary worldview. I mean, if, if this life is all there is, our window of opportunity is getting smaller every day. I mean, our, our clock is literally winding down. Pretty soon we're going to dissipate into nothingness. So if you're going to achieve pleasure or success or financial, whatever, if you're going to reach all your goals, you better get at it now because if the time is coming shortly, you're done. So you gotta, you got to go. And people work and they 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 work tirelessly, exhaustively trying to get whatever that thing is right before they expire. And they get born out, bur burned out and worn out. And that's why I can think of the counselors. Help me feel better about all this. That's not working. But a worldview that says this world is temporary. This is not our eternal home. Success is not about what we do here. Says, I can endure. I can be patient. I can serve others because I have an eternal inheritance waiting for me. Jesus, of course, is our prime example of this. He waited upon the Lord. He trusted God. He entrusted himself entirely to his Father's discretion. He came and said, I, I'm just here to do my Father's will. My equality with God is not something I'm clutching on to. I'm here as a servant, a servant of God, a servant of you, a servant of everyone. I'm coming even to give my life as a ransom, to go to the cross to serve you. 33 years, it's not a long, successful life by human terms. He didn't start anything until he was 30. We, except for that little event of when he's 12 years old, we don't have anything. We don't know what he did. Nobody wrote books about him for the first 30 years of his life. He wasn't successful. He was a carpenter. Maybe he wasn't a, oh, he was probably a good one, but nobody, the word didn't get out. He didn't change the world with his carpentry. He started when he was 30. Three years later, they killed him. Not a very successful endeavor by human standards, but he bought the world. And he gained the world. Because of that, the Bible says, God raised him up to his right hand and gave him cosmic authority. He was humble. He was meek. He entrusted himself to the Father. He served others, and God gave him the cosmic throne over the entire universe. Now, this is not the same thing as being lazy or neglectful. Laziness is never a virtue. And we are to work hard, but it's a difference in motivation and expectation. The world is motivated to get more and more and more and more, and they expect more and more and more and more. But meekness says, I'm not trying to earn a kingdom. I have God's kingdom. He's given it to me freely. Because I love my king, I'm going to wear myself out in service to him and to others. And I don't have any expectations. I've been given it all. There's nothing more he can give me. I don't have it all yet. It's there in promise form. But there's nothing. What can he give you beyond the world? What can he give us beyond himself? 
Nothing. It doesn't get any better than that. And so we work and we work and we work to bless others and to honor Christ. And someday we get the entire universe is our inheritance. So that's the counsel, number one, from our counselor. Don't seek your own glory or your own kingdom. Seek his. Build others up, bless others up, increase their property, and someday you will own the world. Number two, in chapter 5, Matthew 5, 20, he says uh, this. Unless, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let me read that again. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Is there any wonder the Pharisees were leading the charge to crucify this guy? They were the religious leaders. They, had it. they, were, they were the power source. And, God, and Jesus said, they're not getting in. They were very, very religious they went to worship services without fail. If the church doors were open, they were there. Three, four, five, seven days a week, over and over again. They prayed a lot. We know they prayed a lot because they prayed loud. And everybody heard them pray. And they walk in and said, I can I have your attention, please? I'm now going to pray. Pray with me for the next half hour. And listen to my eloquence. Listen to my big words, my long phrasing, and oh, how pious I am. God, you are something. Just look at me. That's the kind of thing they prayed. And they tithed on everything. Jesus said, you tithe on mint and cumin. That's like salt and pepper. You know, one shake for God and before the nine shakes for me. On spices, household goods. They brought their fruits and vegetables to the temple before they ate their own. That's quite a contrast to what all the reports say about Christians, frankly. Uh, the studies I see say that about 3 maybe 4% of professing Christians tithe to the local church. These guys got that part right. The problem was, it was all a show. Jesus' favorite word for these Pharisees was hypocrite. Pretender, play actor. You're praying so everybody can see it. You're giving, you know, when they wrote a check, they came in with the parade, one of those big checks, you know, you see at football games when, when somebody kicks a field goal from 20 yards and uh, for some reason they give them this massive check of $7,000 or whatever. They come in, that's, that's how the Pharisees did. Look, look at my gift to the church building fund. I'm writing the check to pay off the mortgage right here. Oh, no, 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 I, I no, 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 just, just stand up, just stand up, that kind of thing. They, 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 thank you, some of you are following along. They, they did it all for show, to impress people. Jesus said they didn't love God, they loved how people honored them instead. And Jesus said that kind of religion doesn't get you into the kingdom of heaven. Rather, he said, give generously, but don't let anybody know about it. Don't even let yourself know about it. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Now, some of you know what that means. There are times when I you know, think my two parts of my body aren't getting along very well. But, but really, it's kind of a nonsensical statement, right? How do, how do you not right hand not know what your left hand is doing? It gets the point across. Don't even think about it again. Just give and let it go. Don't parade it around. Pay off the mortgage if you have the, the wherewithal to do that. Just don't put it on Facebook when you do. Don't want to be appreciated for your gifts. And don't pray long, eloquent prayers to impress people. Go to your prayer closet, he said. Go by yourself. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't pray out in public, but what's your motive? That's his point. What are you trying to do? Are you really talking to the Father, or are you talking to people to bring attention to yourself? So don't take pride in your big church buildings or your educated clergy or your pastors who write books or anything like that, or your high liturgy. Or don't take pride in your little home church, in your lay ministries, in your informal gatherings. We can take pride in all kinds of things. We can take pride in the big show, we've got the biggest church in town, or the fact that we don't even have a building. We're so pious, we just meet in people's homes, we give everything away. We don't have a professional leadership 
we're all just, just the same. Any of those things can be sources of pride and selfishness, and let's bring glory to ourselves. Jesus says, don't do that. The person who is truly in the kingdom is a person who sincerely loves Jesus. They don't take pride in man-made things. They don't claim superiority. They're just committed to loving him and loving others. This kind of person is in the kingdom because that's what the gospel does to a person. It humbles us. How do you look at the cross? How do you look at God incarnate, perfectly obedient, a man who never sinned for a nanosecond of his entire life, who does by right reign over the universe? How do you look at that person coming down and being a man and dying and letting men treat him the way he let people treat him, and most importantly, suffering the wrath of God for us, and then turn around and say, look at me, will you? I'm pretty good. Look at how we do things at our church. We're way better than those other churches. You, you, you can't do that if you're staring at the cross. Because the cross humbles everybody. I don't deserve anything but eternal wrath and punishment from God. That's all I've earned. And he's given me eternal life and forgiveness and the opportunity to love people. Those are the kind of people that get in the kingdom. Do you realize how wonderful that counsel is? You don't have to earn a PhD in theology to get into God's kingdom. You don't even have to get a master's degree. You don't have to get a bachelor's degree. You don't have to get a high school diploma in theology. Just believe the gospel. Love Jesus. You don't have to go through religious ceremonies like saying a certain number of Hail Marys or doing penance or going to confession. You don't have to do any of that. You don't have to pray certain kinds of prayers or pray in certain ways. You don't have to receive the blessing of a particular church leader, a pope or a bishop or a pastor or an elder. You don't have to receive any of that. You don't have to give two years of your life to some special mission or go around with white shirts and ties on and bicycles. You don't have to do any of that to get in the kingdom. You don't have to conform to some group's rules or requirements. You just believe the gospel and you're in. Trust Christ and you're in the kingdom. Humbly receive his gift, you're in the kingdom. Now this doesn't mean we can do whatever we want. When we trust Christ, we take him as our Savior and also as our Lord. You can't have one without the other. And if he's your Lord, he's your king, he's your master, and masters give commands. Kings give commands, but our motivation for obedience is not trying to earn his favor. He's already bestowed his favor. Our motivation is we love him. We want to please him. We want to honor him. We want to see the world honor him because he's king. He's worthy. But we're already in the kingdom. We are citizens. We're not trying to gain something out of this. So take the advice of our wonderful counselor. Love him with a sincere faith. faith. Rest in his grace. Be real and really trust him. And if you do, the kingdom is yours, Jesus says. Number three. Roman, or, uh, Romans, that's January. Uh, Matthew 5, 43 and following says, You've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? For some of you need to translate, do not even the Democrats do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your Father is perfect. How easy is it to be nice to people who are nice to you? It's 
pretty easy, right? They smile, they greet you, you're happy to smile and greet them back. How easy is it to be nice to people who talk well of you, who spread good cheer around the neighborhood, around the office about you? Oh, you you're happy to return the favor and the compliment. Somebody gives you a really nice Christmas gift, you don't mind spending some money and getting them a really nice Christmas gift. But what about the guy who's spreading lies and rumors about you in the neighborhood? You know, you're some wacko Christian guy that is legalistic all the time, or you dump your trash in their backyard when you don't, or, or whatever. How easy is it to be nice to people who have it in for you? It's not easy. It's hard. It goes against so much of way, the way we are naturally, the way we've been programmed, and the way we are sinful. Yet Jesus just told his disciples, do that. Love them. Bless them. Want their life to be blessed. They offend you. They mistreat you. Don't treat them like the world does. Serve them. Be good to them. Do you see how wonderful this is? It's extraordinary. Jesus is teaching us how to live like sons and daughters of God. That's what he said. You will be like your father. You will be sons and daughters of God if you do this because that's what God does. When blessings are poured out on the United States of America and our, our economic uh, look, outlook is strong and people's 401ks are off the charts and we're prospering, that doesn't just happen to Christians. In fact, most of the people we know that are experiencing that kind of blessing are probably non-Christians. God sends his good things upon everybody regardless of their righteousness. And Jesus said, if you want to be like your father, you do that too. Do good to those who have it in for you. Bless them. Prosper them. This is good news. You don't have to get the power to create a universe to be like God. That's good news because you're never going to have it. You don't have to become utterly sinless to be like your father. That's good news too because this side of death, you're not going to achieve that. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to control everything to resemble God. You can resemble God by blessing those who persecute you. That's what God does. And that's what his children do. This is radically different from the advice of the counselors of the world. Most counselors want to help you be happy, to please yourself. Jesus teaches you how to please God. Counsel today is teaching you how to feel good. Now, I know I'm making broad statements. I'm a counselor. Okay? So this is not lumping all counselors into one setting. But the world's view of counseling is you need to feel good. Jesus says, I want you to experience joy for eternity. And joy now, but that's not the same thing as happy feelings now. Today, you're going to get a lot of communication techniques and therapy and self-talk. Jesus says, resolve hostility between you and opponent by deferring. If he slaps you across the face, Give him the other side and let him slap that side if he wants to. I would doubt that you would go to any non-Christian counselor and get that kind of instruction. They stole your car, give them the keys to your van too. What? I'm paying you how much? 200 bucks an hour? No way, I'm out of here. That's the kind of counsel Jesus gave. It, it was wonderful, it was extraordinary. I'm not saying you have to give him your car, van. I'm just using an example extraordinary, wonderful. It's not the way we humans think. This is the kind of advice that Jesus gave. And when he was done, Matthew 7 says this, when he'd finished these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. This is a different evaluation of Jesus than most people have today. Today, people are willing to admit that he was wise. They'll even say he was a good teacher. But they're not willing to say he taught with authority. Wise counsel, and again, I like their Christ, the, the, the self-denying, the, the blessing others, 
uh, those kind of things, they're happy to do that. And, and me would say, yeah, if we put into practice what he said, the world would be a better place. You know, if, if you became selfless, the world would be a better place. If you gave all you had for the poor, the world would be a better place. And I'll give a little bit along the way too, but you know, usually it's always you do that. And of course, they love his instruction, judge not lest ye be judged. Right? If everybody lived according to that, the world would be a better place. We could all get along just fine if nobody judged anybody. But they don't want to say that he had any real authority. C.S. Lewis is the one who articulated this so well many years ago. If Jesus is not God, the very last thing he can be is good, a good teacher. Right? Think that through. If he's not God then there are two other options. One is, he's a liar. He claimed to be God. If he's not God, that's about the king of all lies, isn't it? I'm God. Serve me, worship me. I'm God. I'm going to raise myself from the dead. I hold the keys to heaven and hell in my hand because I'm God. If he's a liar, don't call him a good teacher. Sensible people don't entrust themselves to liars. I'm going to resist all urges to tell more political jokes there. Sensible people don't do that. We know this guy can't be trusted if he's a liar. If he's a fraud, if he's a cheat, you don't admire him, you don't follow him, you say, I don't want to listen to him. You don't call him a good teacher. You don't try to get other people to say, yes, he's a good teacher. What does the evidence say? There's absolutely zero evidence that Jesus was a liar. There's no case to be made there. So the other option then is that he was a lunatic. Stark, raving, mad. The guy thought he was God. We do know, you probably heard about people who think they're God. We don't usually follow their advice. We put them away. We don't want them out in society where they can hurt somebody because people like that are scary. They think they're God. You don't call them good teachers. Let's let them write books and we'll start implementing everything they say because the guy thinks he's God. No, we, we, we just say, don't follow the, that, that weirdo. He's lost his mind. He's a few circuits short of a logic board, if you know what I mean. The guy's not equipped to be followed. Well, again, what's the evidence say? There's absolutely no indication Jesus was psychotic. People didn't like him, people didn't agree with him, and he gave some extraordinarily different advice, but there's no indication. You read his story, you read the Bible, he's not a crazy man. Which only leaves that he is who he claimed to be. He's Lord. He's King. He's God. Which is what Isaiah said 600 years prior, they will call him Mighty God. Now, he's not actually ever called Mighty God. That's not the point. The point is he would be God in the flesh. He would be Emmanuel, God with us. And he is. This is why he received worship from men. Because he's God. Think about the other occurrences when men bowed down before other men. Maybe the apostles or even angels bowing down before these great men, these angels, and immediately the person receiving the worship says, get up. Don't do that. I'm a creature just like you. The one guy who did receive worship from men, worms ate him from the inside out. Get up. Please don't put me in that position. Stop worshiping me. I'm not God. When they came and bowed down before, God, before Jesus, he took their worship. This is right. This is good. You should bow before me because I am God. This is why he can have authority over heaven and earth. After the resurrection, he said, and the Father has now given to me rule and reign over the entire universe. Why could he do that? Because he's God. You don't give the rule of the universe to a human being who's merely a human being. But if he's God, he has the right to rule and to reign. He can raise up one nation, take down another. He can sovereignly work all things together for the good of his people because he's God. 
And lastly, because he's God, everyone will stand before him someday and be evaluated. This is what we're told in 2 Corinthians. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. All judgment, Jesus said, has been handed over to me. Even the Father's not judging anymore. Jesus is judging. Someday, every human being who's ever lived is going to stand before the throne of Jesus Christ and give an account for their life. And he single-handedly holds the determination of where we spend eternity. Because he's God. He has the right to do that. He is the one to whom we must answer for all of our actions. He makes the final determination. This is the real Jesus. This is the Jesus, I, uh, the child that Isaiah prophesied about. This is the Jesus we believe in and that we must hold fast to. Life is not a choose-your-own-adventure story. Did you ever read those books? I loved those books when I was a kid. You could decide, is it going to go this way or is it going to go this way? I can only imagine with the technology today, you could probably do some great video games and stuff. I mean, some of you are nodding your head like you've played those. I didn't even know they existed. I thought it was a great idea. I guess I didn't just invent that, did I? I can you imagine how fun that would be? But life is not like that. We don't get to decide who Jesus is and, and what the outcome of everything is. We don't get to decide if, if Jesus is this kind of God or that kind of God. He is who he is. And the Bible's what tells us who he is. And we don't get to decide that this baby grows up, goes from his cute stage to his adolescent stage to his very gentle, humble stage, and then he stays there forever and just loves everybody and everybody's great. He's the one that said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and his response will be, depart from me, I never knew you. That's the Jesus who is king. That's the child who was born about 2,000 years ago, the living God, the one who gives counsel different than anybody else, who turns the world upside down, who turns everything on its head, who says, it's not about you. It's about me. It's about serving and loving and worshiping me. And if you do that, he says, you will achieve more joy, more satisfaction, more hope, more glory than you would ever dare try to achieve on your own. It's one of the great paradoxes of the gospel. Choose your own adventure in life, and it's not going to be anything compared to what God has in store for you. See, that's the lie that America tells us, the lie that our flesh and the world tells us, it's the lie that we want to believe, that Satan tells us, if I could only get this, I'd be happy. If I could only do this, I'd be successful. If only this, I would be content. And there is nothing in this life, in this world, in our experience, nothing that will ever fully satisfy except Christ. So what the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about. We were just talking about this the other night in class. The man who had it all literally had everything this world had to offer. Nobody was more wealthy, more prosperous, more successful, more, had more opportunities for pleasure than King Solomon. Nobody. And what's his refrain? Vanity. Vanity. It's all meaningless. I'm rich got more women than I know what to deal, do with or deal with. Everything I touch, he's King Midas, it all turns to gold. He had power, he had good health, he had God-given wisdom beyond everybody else who ever lived except Christ. And what do he say? I got nothing. It's meaningless. You can't out-imagine God. You can't Draw out, draw up how your life will go and it be anywhere near what is going to be ours in the next age. Because a child was born. And he came to secure for us an inheritance beyond our wildest dreams. But we have to live his story and not make one up on our own. So our, our Lord counsels us toward joy and hope and glory in his eternal kingdom. 
my challenge to you today is be who Christ calls you to be. Forfeit your interests. Forfeit your your petty earthly desires. I know I quote this all the time, but it's such a great statement by C.S. Lewis. If you aim at heaven, you get earth thrown in. You enjoy life here because you're not looking for this life to benefit you. But if you aim at earth, you get neither. There's nothing but dissatisfaction here. But in Christ, in the eternal kingdom, this government that is resting on his shoulders, this one who is our, who is our wonderful counselor and mighty God, in him, if we live for him in the next age, it is beyond our understanding to grasp how profoundly satisfying it's going to be. And it's ours because a child was born and a son was given. Let's pray. Father, I'll be the first to say there are many things in this world that are alluring, that are interesting. Things that I know would make me happy if I just had that or could experience that. If this had been different when I was a kid, if I'd gone down that path instead of this one, I I can foresee great times of great joy. And yet if I believe anything I just said, it would have still left me wanting. Because the wonderful counselor who is God in the flesh said, Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me and you will have abundant life everlasting. Father, may we be people. Transform us into those kinds of people. Loosen our grip on our expectations of this life. Loosen our grip on our expectations of our spouses, of our children, of our parents, of our siblings, of our neighbors, co-workers. Father, free us to enjoy the simple pleasures of this life because we're not really looking to them for ultimate experience. Father, help us to be people who sing the songs of Christmas. What child is this? And Joy to the world and hark the herald angels sings and on and on and on because we believe that Jesus Christ is that King and He is risen and He lives forever and we will be in His kingdom forevermore and it will be an eternally satisfying kingdom. Father, make us people who are very slow to accept the counsel of this world's counselors and very quick to run to your word, to seek the guidance of your spirit and people who love you and be willing to receive counsel that goes against everything that seems right in atheistic evolutionary culture. Father, loose our lips to proclaim true joy to a lost and dark world that needs needs to be told what kind of light they should even be looking for, as well as hearing the truth of Christ. And we pray all this in his name. Amen.